So hi everyone, welcome to our panel, our discussion on regenerative, rejuvenative farming. So for some context, um, Jaden and I are both leads on two separate projects. Uh, Jaden is a lead on Slice and I am a lead on Movable Village. So Slice looks into the future of food, while Movable Village looks into the future of living solutions. And um, somehow it's, it's serendipitous that farming has actually been the intersection point of um, these two uh, seed projects. And we've been looking into this and we are really curious because um, there's only so much uh, knowledge that we have because we do not come from a traditionally a farming background or agricultural or um, botanical background. And yeah, so we would like to hear from you guys a little bit more and also share with you what we have been thinking about. Yeah, so I think as this is especially important, this topic is important for us to look at because uh, during the this period of COVID, we realized that, hey, we've supply supply side shocks we are forced to our, our food system, you know like what it means for you to have a food system like you know the, the idea of a resilient food system might differ from individuals right and my question to the audience is like what does it mean for us to have a resilient food system does it mean that uh, for all of us to grow our own food or is it for our country to be able to secure imports uh good with other countries so that imports can come in anytime or does it mean that you know like so what are what, what is your ideal of a resilient food system so this is a constant question that we would like to ask you while we proceed with our presentation yeah yeah so um recently julian i watched this documentary called the need to grow it's an award-winning documentary and um, we'd like to show you guys the first minute of the trailer just to you know spark some thoughts One second. If we stay on our course, we can look at a worldwide catastrophe. Industrial agriculture is first and foremost a war against the earth because it is a war against all species since you're bringing raw chemicals into food production and all they're doing is killing. We cannot fight nature. You cannot poison things to the extent that where you won't win. It's a challenge to live in a world where our government can have counted on to defend us from an industrial food system that's actually making us sick. Hopefully soon the planet will change. People should really learn about how to help your community and help yourself in life. You can grow 100% organic, nutrient-dense food at warp speed, basically. The stuff will grow anything. There is a secret here that we've got to unlock. What we've tried to do here is accelerate the regeneration of soil. Well, I've done some tests. Okay. Yeah. So, um, this I think this documentary was really um, heartbreaking for me when I realized that um, the way that we have treated the earth is very, is very unfairly for the amount that like, the planet gives to us. Yeah, and I'm really curious to find out like um, how can we make it better? Or we might even have to take it a step further instead of just looking at ways that we can farm um, with zero waste, but how can we use farming or other technologies to um, help the earth recover to where it used to be? Hmm. I think this is a important consideration as we look at uh, topics like like our own food security. So like in Singapore, the context is that we are a very small uh, nation. And then previously we were we were forced to think about, you know, our water supply, right? Or how do we get enough water, even though we are surrounded by lots of seawater, but uh, we, we still have water from Malaysia. So we were forced to come up with our own water recycling uh, program. But right now, um, in the uh, period of COVID, we are forced to think about food security. And I think our government agency, SFA, has done a great job in uh, pushing out policies to ensure that you know, Singapore has uh, enough food for the future. So I think the three main strategies are setting, uh, diversifying our importance, also maintaining good relationships with our neighboring countries like Australia and um, Malaysia and also to grow it so there's a push for tenders on uh, unused spaces like our, our car parks and also 
uh, new agricultural belt being uh, formed by the government agencies. And also lastly, to grow overseas, finding uh, appropriate plots to grow overseas. So it's quite interesting to see that um, it was local production must be resilient against climate uh, climate resource and economic constraints. And there is also a um, uh, mandate that, you know, all these farms should leverage on science, technology, and innovation uh, enablers to achieve resilience. So no matter we are, if you're talking about soilless farming, talking about soy-based farming, we have to think about how we can use technology and innovation to give us that extra push uh, to get a better food security. Mm. Yeah. 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 Sure, you want to say something? Oh no, I just thinking about how like um they are very like nice intersections when it comes to innovation, like um uh those like, drip irrigation like systems. So it's a very, very simple tube that goes to like the center or the, the base of the plant and it drips a small amount of water regularly to keep mm -hmm. the plant nourished. Yeah, and I think that like when we're looking at uh large scale um policy making, we tend to also lose sight of small innovations that might be able to tip us over to a whole new paradigm yeah and mm. yeah so from i think policy i'm guess i'm trying to highlight that from the macro versus the micro point of view there are many things mm. that are lost yeah sure. mm. Mm. maybe before we into the gaps that we have uh, currently in our food system maybe we can give a brief introduction about our project um as you, some of you guys I have seen, um, Slice is actually an experimentation and incubation platform that supports ideas relating to the future of food. And what we're trying to achieve is to develop a uh, circular, sustainable, and tech-enabled uh, food future. And we are looking at um, all the different stages of, um, you know, of food production all the way to food recycling. So this is actually a very... Um, big challenge and we have to work together with collaborators such as students from polytechnics and uni researchers uh, and startups to co-create and test bait these solutions so we kind of need um more people to look at um all these problems and test bait it so that we can see whether or not uh, this circular food system can be achieved so we actually have a place where we have a physical farm that's coming up and also a cafe right now it's experimental flat so we are hoping to deploy all these technologies and uh, do our best to make this happen. Yeah. So maybe we can show the next. Um, yeah, this is actually the mock-up of the space. Uh, we actually would like to envision a food system that is zero miles and centralized so that you know every community is able to uh, grow your own food and be self-sustainable. Right. The hooks of it is you know you get more nutritious uh, produce and also you get reduce the carbon emissions from other countries so sometimes it's better to do things uh, to rely on yourself than to rely on others even especially in the times of crisis uh, so this is something that we're looking at yeah we're going to share a bit about movable uh, village yeah so movable village is basically a, pro a test bit for prototyping living solutions so we look in things like energy we look into things like um culture and also structure and what what is the um, infrastructure and what what is in our living space that allows us to thrive. Yeah, so um, the key part, part about Movable Village is that it's truly a platform to bring collaborators together and to test bit new synergies between technologies. Yeah, because like I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes it's just that one small push or that one insight that can bring you like miles further. Yeah, and so this is uh, an overview of like what Movable Village is going to look like. Yeah, where we have farming and we have deployment, we have event spaces, as well as the test building of various kinds of technologies. Maybe it's a uh, deployment logistic technology, or maybe it's um, something that can help us be more in tune with nature, to listen to nature using sensors. Yeah, and all these things will be um, formulated together with collaborators as well as the other city community. So um, we are located at Launchpad, next to Launchpad at GID. So the Jurong Innovation District is um, one of the biggest um, innovation districts in Singapore. Audacity is fundamentally a partnership between JTC and Misoto. So this is a just a, a bird's eye view of the plot. And this is a, um, recently we completed the land survey and we have about almost 4,000 square meters of uh, green land. Yeah. 
And as Yang An mentioned earlier in the other panel discussion, um, one of the hottest, latest um, launches by Audacity is Permacolony. And Permacolony is looking to build scalable communities that are replicable or adjusted for different contexts. They are sustainable in food, energy, water, and resilient while, while incorporating ideas such as advanced manufacturing, different logistic systems, and allowing humans to live to their, their highest potential. Yeah, because we always find that cities have been made for um, humans to be to be productive and to be efficient. But actually, um, I think that there's a part of us deep inside that um, everyone's purpose or everyone's um, intention with living can be totally different. Yeah, And we want to bring all these people along because when, when you are able to live to your highest potential, that's when you also come contribute and um, be a part of a community and bring the world to a better place. Yeah, so we're looking at it as a ground up kind of initiative where, you know, we bring the community together to work towards these goals. And um, like, you know, in light of COVID, it's really highlighted the cracks in our society. And therefore, decentralization is a big part of it because in the decentralization of it, we can also become more resource efficient and we can also allow people to be more autonomous by empowering them to create and um, the world that they want to see. So it's true, like the participation of this community and that um, um, that real hunger to you know save the earth and also like push it forward. That um, we're going to we want to enable um, these kind of communities to be built. Yeah. So um, this are some of the hypotheses and um, goals of Slice under Puma Colony. Uh, Jay, do you want to talk about it? Maybe I can uh, talk about it later. But basically idea is to develop a food system that is resilient, autonomous, and harmonious, meaning we look into uh, things which are, okay, so in terms of food distribution, uh, how do we like distribute, empower more people to be able to have access to food? Right now, we have enough food, but we, that is not uh, di uh, distributed uh, properly. We also look at um, diets that are nutritious and environmentally friendly. Um, yeah, maybe I can elaborate a bit more about like uh, things like using polycultures in our food production system later. Okay. And uh, for this was this was the hypothesis or like the goals that Movable Village had for Puma Colony. So um, Puma Colony is really the focal point where seed projects come together to contribute their ideas and um, work towards really a moonshot um, ideal. So for Movable Village, we wanted members to have autonomy over their living spaces and to coexist symbi symbiotically with their environment. So it's in the innovative use of space and redefining the way we grow and, and live yeah, that can integrate not just functionality and aesthetics, but also um, purpose and um, yeah, new kinds of technologies that can bring us further in terms of autonomy and um, purpose. Yeah, and um, so for Perma Colony, we have, we have announced the incubation um, accelerator called um, Moonshot Perma Colony together with our um, partner, uh, our partner Salto, yeah, we're looking for 20 startups and we have 50 over uh, mentors and investors to bring and um, to bring these ideas to reality, yeah, or to push it even further, yeah, that can be applied in a colony um, in different ways, yeah. Yeah, so, maybe I can, yeah, maybe we can talk a bit about where we are situated to give people of what to so uh, as she mentioned, we are situated at uh, Innovation District it's at King Tech. We're very near uh, Nanyang Technological University, also A-Star and also uh, Clean and Renewable Energy Startups. Uh, we are very near, we are very near Jurong Eco Garden, it's just right beside us. It has, it's a five, hect uh, five hectare garden. And you can see that there's actually lots of uh, diversity of edible plants for a little and we found things like the Singapore cherry also uh, a cousin of uh, Patai which is like a bean that when you smell it um might be a bit funky but cook it with a uh, chili it's tasty. so these are actually things that are behind our backyard and part of nature uh it was very we were very grateful that it was pointed out to us uh, otherwise we would not actually know of this uh, biodiversity. So before we actually inherited our uh, land, uh, we actually went into the plot where movable village and perma colonies uh, physical manifestation is going to be. So we walked in and we, uh, we, we checked it out with some urban gardeners and 
we saw lots of uh, we saw like rich soil and we saw um, interesting um, fruits and I think we cousin of Binjo, we also found this thing called scarlet god that is used in Indian cuisine. So we actually felt like it was very promising for us to inherit this piece of land. Um, but something happened. So um, should we share about the land clearance process? Yeah. So when we looked at the luscious green, we really thought that you know we, all we had to do was come down and like take a grass cutter or some shears to um to to clean it up so that we could assess it because of the tall grass, there were um quite a few dangers such as like um small snakes or uh, wild animals, and yeah. So um because our, we partner with JTC and I think in a very very traditional sense. Like when land is being passed from one owner to another, um, a lot of it um, in the construction industry, what we do is we um, tear it down completely, we raise it down, so we cut down the trees and then we flatten the land. And um, many contractors are used to working that way. So when the contractor was tasked to clear the undergrowth, um, what they did was actually they brought in two uh, heavy machineries, like excavators, and um, which actually weigh almost like one to two tons, yeah, to come in and um, effectively dig out like all the like shrubbery yeah we, we were very specific to ask them not to clear the trees yeah but um through this process they were the machinery was so efficient that by the time we went down um they were already like almost done so um from the feedback from our farm the farm community that Jaden has built up over the last couple of months uh, we were we were told like hey don't throw away the stuff that is being like um cut away because those actually contain a lot of um, nutrients that can go back into the soil. So the contractors helped us to like, pile it up neatly at the site. And, but sadly, because of the weight of the machinery that goes around, we could see that the caterpillar track marks on the ground. And the weight of the machine probably did quite a bit of damage to the soil by compacting it too much and by um, killing maybe the earthworms and the um, tiny critters in the soil. And following that, actually, we were, we were really shocked because um, right now in Singapore, it's a monsoon season. So we had like two or three days of um, on and off continuous rain and it revealed to us the real condition of the soil underneath. Yeah, that um, there was a lot of construction rubble being mixed into the soil. So once again, I think this is a problem that like um, is all over Singapore and maybe in different parts of the world where um, contractors tend to mix their construction rubble into soil because it's an easy way of dumping it and getting rid of it. Yeah, and um, I think Previously, there wasn't that kind of understanding that we should respect the soil the same way, you know, we didn't have this idea that we should respect the sea. We thought that we could dump our waste into the sea, it was cheap, it was convenient, and that, you know, it would handle itself. But soon enough, you know, if you think about it, a couple of steps later, you're like, hey, that, that doesn't really sound right, you know, like, if I'm dumping my trash into the sea, then my fish is, my fish is like eating it, and then I'm eating the fishes, and then it goes back to our bodies. So the same thing with the soil, right? We found out that it's like um, heavily... Um, um, there's a lot of discarded material like trash and construction and yeah this set us on this path where for me as um, looking into like living um, infrastructure um, I, I want to look for deploying like structures on the plot and for Jaden as well um, coming from the food aspect she was really excited to start growing things and when we saw this like our heart sank and we were like hey man, we, we both need to work together, tag team, and um, look into making the, the soil and like our new home like um, so much better. Yeah, so um, in, in Audacity, we try not to work in silos, but um, we also have concurrent and parallel tracks. So um, yeah, maybe um, Jay can share a little bit on how Slice has um, evolved over the year, and I will then touch on World War Village. Mm, sure. Yeah, so I think Slice actually kickstarted a year ago. So we had a soft launch of Slice. We actually got in uh, an Alaska container farm. It's a, a standard shipping size container that we can grow 70 kg of leafy greens. Uh, and we grow that uh, last year. So we knew, okay, this is actually something that we can do. Uh, and, and that spurred our R&D phase. We thought about, hey, what are the different species that we can grow hydroponically and also you know out, out there in the sun um, and we started asking a lot of questions as to you know, the inputs that we need in terms of city and nutrients and so on and so forth you know i think it actually a lot more and right right now it's really getting uh three people who the expert urban garden 
solutions or like people in the tech space find the solution for it. So December onwards, we are in the phase of asking the right questions. And then COVID striked, right? We really wanted to go on the ground to visit more farms and also document some um, need, like plants as well in our local climate. But um, COVID happened and we were quite bound by uh, the restrictions. So we decided, hey, why don't we go virtual and come up with this Get Growing Challenge where we come up with a series of videos and also a plant clinics to uh, help people who believe that they have brown thumb to grow some food, right? So we were very fortunate because the farming community is one that is very uh, keen to that and we were very heartened to see that. Uh, and in August, we managed to work with uh, this operator. They are part of a startup called Insect Farm Technologies. What they're looking at is taking big chunk of food waste, like okra waste that is like uh, uh, produced when you make soybean milk, for example, and tofu, turn this into premium aqua feed. So this is really us because we've always wanted to uh, have that future hopefully um an agriculture kind of as well so that you know in our in our closed loop system we can be able to one product waste and even uh get seafood to to consume and uh and then last but not least in september we had the launch of perma colony which should we share with you so excited how this problem statement is being spread across like, the world and then we have this uh, reach to more potential collaborators to work on this uh, set of problem statement. Mm. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So for us in Mubo Village, while well, in September, size was already at a soft launch stage, Mubo Village was only being conceptualized. You know, we were asking the questions as to like, um, what do people need to live and then what are we going to focus our efforts on? And in December, we got into talks with our friend, um, Kennedy Power, to look into building a solar system to support the container farm that Jaden was mentioning. Yeah. And um, after that, like, you know, COVID hit and then we realized, you know, we, we were given the opportunity, whether it was uh, serendipitous um, to really investigate again, like, if we're going to move forward, like, how careful do we want to be? Because we, COVID actually, ironically, gives us the luxury of time, right? Yeah, mm. because we slow down and really think about it. And so we went to do the land survey and the clearance and we still push the project forward. And to today, we had just finished the undergrowth clearance and the site survey. So I think, like, um, what I would like, really like to highlight with this is that this is the convergence of the two projects. Yeah, we slice after the R and D phase and the get growing challenge. We realize there are certain um, systemic shocks that um, that we face with our food supply, and also for mobile village. You know, when we thought that um, originally it's like oh, let's just deploy and deploy and deploy. Like you know, let's just buy things and like you know get people in to add things in. But then when we realize like hey, you know this soil is like not good. Like, do I really want to do this that way? Why don't we, like, mm. take it in a bite-sized manner? Yeah, that's why we really, mm. like, look into, um, mm. yeah, into this initiative. So the question mm. is, what are our next steps, right? Um, what do mm. we want to achieve, like, with our projects that are coming together? Yeah. yeah, it's very important as well because I feel like food production shouldn't be uh, thought about as thought, right? Sometimes when we try to grow things uh, in our hierarchy, we will... It's like, hey, we don't have enough sun because we are designed in a way that they don't want too much sun. The thing is, can there be an optimal way of building uh, buildings that we live in? Well, like thinking about food production as well to maximize the, the use of space. Yeah. yeah. So I'll go really to think about how we can, you know, while we have the moonshot of achieving 100% self-sufficiency in food, we don't want to do it in a way that growing sweet potato for everyone so that you can eat the tubers and the greens. But rather we have to think about like what's the nutrients that we are feeding ourselves to have a full spectrum of nutrients. And also to, um, to think about what are the crops that thrive in our climate. It's so important because, hey, we live in a tropical climate. We have great sun, we have great rain. Like why are we not using it, right? So there are so many different crops that uh, thrive well in our climate that, you know, they, they can even be weeds, you know, but only if we know about this knowledge, then we can energy and resources efficiently to grow uh, food to feed us. Yeah. Yeah, and then from the movable village aspect, you know, you really want to create an environment where food is part of living because we have realized that like um, we have been shoeboxed into our homes where we don't really understand the processes that keep us alive. Yeah, as well as, you know, inclusivity through empowerment because we found that farming is a really effective tool at making people feel like they're uh, contributing and doing things that uh, 
doing things that contribute back to their quality of life. Yeah, including the community building aspect. Yeah. Mm. So, um, one reason why we are looking to soil generation is because we met a couple of studies that talk about how um, when soil is healthy, it's actually a very, very good carbon sink. So, it, it sequesters carbon dioxide from the air because there are a lot of uh, microorganisms and small, um, small plants and undergrowth that take in a lot of this carbon dioxide. Yeah. As well as um, by increasing the quality of soil, we can cultivate microorganisms like, or maybe even macroorganisms like earthworms and like, insects that can help to break down um, the decomposing matter. Yeah, such that it feeds the soil that then feeds the food that feeds us. You said, you know, in Singapore, there's a group of people who are very passionate. They've been doing lots of great initiatives like the Soil Preparation Project. Uh, they are seeding in a lot of um, social soil communities. What what that means is getting people together to pull together their food waste and uh, turn them into nutrients for food, uh, nutrients for our soil, yeah, to grow food. Yeah, so my question is that right now there are a few people, but uh, how can we look at this at the larger scale, like in terms of uh, doing this in more areas so that we, you know, we hit two birds, we kill if one store sequest carbon and also grow ample or uh, cultivate ample land for us to uh, produce nutritious food. Yeah, so this is actually our highlight Mr. Tang in the center. Uh, he's actually an uh, urban gardener who has been who has set up the first urban farm in Hong Kong uh, decades ago. And now, uh, after retiring as a physics teacher in Singapore, he is uh, farming at different places, one including MGS. Yeah, so what he does is he collects food waste from food vendors and also uh, from the staff pantry to every day for to do this thing called composting. So lots of great effort, but it's uh, laborious as well. So how can we use technology um, to do this at scale? Yeah, I think because usually um, there's this idea that um, farming is supposedly uh, laborious and backdated and then, you know, it's like a people say like, oh, going back to your roots. Yeah, but actually, like, I find that there is there is definitely a science to it and there are ways that we can hack it and to make it more efficient for us as well. So um, mm. I think that we should not conflict the the fact that um, farming is backwards and then technology is forwards and there's this um, dialectic pool. Yeah, but instead, mm. we all we can come together, which is the idea of also permaculture, you know, that looking at systems symbiotic, symbiotically yeah, which is actually mm. very much a scientific way of thinking, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So something else that we're looking at is uh, increasing our crop diversity. Um, I think that is one of a global problem as well. Uh, because of monocropping practices, we have uh, lesser and lesser knowledge and usage of, of uh, all the identifiable like edible plants that we have in the world. So I think we are only like eating. 13 or 30 uh, out of like, like I'm not, I'm not sure what, what's again, like 20,000, 30,000, you know, it's just a very small amount of uh, crops that we are eating out of everything that we can possibly eat that is great for us, you know. Yeah. One thing that we're looking at is understanding nutritional and medicinal benefits. Uh, and we will introduce this amazing plant called Palmyra that you might know it in a form of uh, Gula Malaka palm sugar so this amazing fruit you can get uh, sugar that more sustainability uh, sustainably farmed than uh, cane sugar so it, let, it uses less water it doesn't use pesticide it doesn't need much fertilizer uh, and you, if you juice it you get this amazing drink and you can ferment it into a tasty alcohol as well and then you can take parts of it uh, uh, let's say the leaves and the husk to make it into utility utility product like boxes and even bright upon it, right? So this was actually found at Kalang, this central part of Singapore. But if it, it was not identified to us, we would have lost this knowledge of this plant, right? So this is a initiative that we hope to document and also um, spread the knowledge so that more people can grow this and eat these nutrients. Yeah, I think that, uh... Something that I, I, I'm not too sure about, but uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but is that um, Gula Malaka used to be made with this plant, but then soon it got converted into using um, brown sugar and coconut. Yeah, and coconut ah. sugar. 
Yeah, so then right. they make it more commercial, you know. Like people always talk about mm. the quality of Gula Melaka as you touch like whether it's soft, soft or like hard, hard, like you know, crystal mm. kind. And when it's mm. very pearly, it means that it's very high in um like raw sugar. No, not raw sugar, white sugar content. Yeah. Mm. The Palmera, the kind of sugars that come from the Palmera, I assume actually is more of the softer kind, but it also has more flavor. But somehow the mm. way that you know, industrialization and uh, practices have moved forward. We have completely forgotten that, you know, this is like the real, like, um, the real tasty thing that our ancestors were eating. Yeah, and it is also nutritious. Yeah, and there have been studies that show that this fruit has staved off um, starvation in many um, different civilizations in the past. So you'll find these trees planted along the, um, along the corridors of Angkor Wat. Yeah, and it's mm. also um, very revered, like in India. Yeah, so it's not just about, you know, uh, Angkor Wat or India, but also in Singapore like, or in Malaysia, you know, this has been used like, in many different ways. And mm. uh, yeah, we have like, sort of like, forgotten this knowledge. Yeah. So yeah, when we talk about all these questions, so what, what are certain gaps that we find um, uh, keeping us from achieving our goals and how do we maybe address them? I think that for mm. firstly, in the context of Singapore, there is this idea of, uh, there's a policy gap as well as a mindset gap. Well, you know, we think that there's this um, mindset that goes into policy setting that says Singapore is not an agricultural society. You know, uh, we have no space to grow our food. Yeah. But then, like, the main question would be then, is, isn't it a matter of implementation? Yeah. How do we have a, a, the appropriate technology to help us fulfill the vision of a city that's a resilient food system? Yeah, because, you know, mm. right now we have the 30 by 30 goal. And while I really see that the potential of hydroponics is there in creating that high output um, leafy greens and you know like things that we love like kale and strawberries is actually um, there's I feel that there's a misalignment in terms of policy setting because um, there are many other soy based farms that are being shut down or not in the name of converting into hydroponics specifically but they've been shut down for like military users and for like um, estate redevelopments and I think the question that I would then ask the policy makers is there is so much injection of effort and capital into building new farms, but why are we trashing and like shutting down our old farms when they both are moving towards the same goal, right? So, mm. like, how do we find that balance of different solutions to keep us a holistic and resilient um, policy that can um, lead us to that greater future? Mm. Yeah. yeah. There's also another part that we need to look at right? in order for us to be fully self-sufficient of our food. So do we need to be self-sufficient in terms of the input, right? Or uh, when we think about, I, I think Stuart mentioned that even for hydroponics, because it's such an infant technology as compared to uh, the ways of like growing food outdoors. So like things like, what's the energy that you're using to power um, a hydroponic system that needs AC and also LED lights? So that is where we can look at like using more renewable sources energy and how is the water being used uh right now i think in terms of like the hydroponics um water you water that is an output from the after cycling weeks uh, it has to be collected up uh, through a company in singapore for disposal just because of the uh, nutrients content that is left inside is there a chance for uh, us to use that output for other things and um you know things like that and for for nutrients wise, um, A and B, and also like uh, our our supplies of like compost and fertilizer, are we self sufficient when it comes to that. And last but not least, growing medium like the soy and the soy that we use. You know, as Shui mentioned earlier, that if we don't continue, if we continue in our path and not do anything, we have sixty years of farmable soy. So are we buying soy from overseas or what? Uh, that's something that we have to look. And in terms of uh, soilless farming, we need to look at what is the growing medium that we are using. Is it, uh, are we self-sufficient in terms of that? Or are we relying on our neighbors for such resources as well? So these are the questions that we are asking and yeah, and constantly finding the, the right solution for it. Yeah, it's also the question of like propagating, right? Like if you're always importing mm -hmm. like overseas because um, when you have like kale and strawberries as like really like prized crops that everyone loves and um, they it's always marketed in Singapore as things you normally would not be able to grow. Yeah. Mm. But then like, um, how do you perpetuate it? Like in the end, you still have to import your seeds from maybe New Zealand or America. Mm. Yeah. 
And for a lot of leafy greens, once it's like consumed, it's, it's done in a hydroponic system as compared to like a soy-based system where you might propagate it in a certain way. So there's mm. also questions like, you know, how do we make our linear systems more circular? Yeah, mm. and you know, feed ourselves better. Mm. Yeah. So we met all these gaps, right? Like the, the big challenge is to ask us, like what are the appropriate technologies that can be applied to soy-based farming, farming. So I feel like technology should not be seen as an, an evil source, right? Um, when talking to a lot of uh, gardeners, I think there's always this um, thought that, hey, like there is already like enough technology for permaculture-based uh, farming, you know, like, you know, working with the nature, you've got already sunlight, you've already got like rain, if you cultivate the microorganism and put in your food waste, everything is there. But I think there's also other things like, you know, when when it comes to back breaking later, can we can we, you know, for example, use robotics in that um in that area. Yeah. So this is the question that we've been asking ourselves a lot. Uh and yeah. of uh solid farming of course uh we can look at um innovating like what is the nutrient source like you know changing from something that is nutrient a system that only has some key macronutrients and micronutrients can we look at more organic sources of uh for hydroponics and all that mm. yeah so this is actually a design that was featured in the documentary The Need to Go. I highly recommend everybody watch it, like just to uh, keep an open mind. They're quite, I think, um, a bit of drama because you know they have to make the documentary exciting. But basically, the new powerhouse is designed by um, an inventor and um, a thinker. He's, he's a he knows a lot of different things. He like was into technology and science and even like into space uh, technology, and he designed this thing called the Green Powerhouse. So basically how it works is that the only input is um, wood chips. Yeah, I think it's locally sourced wood chips from uh, offcuts, yeah, from a neighboring factory. And um, he has applied a large amount of scientific ways of thinking into the process that makes it like super green. So um, the wood chips are combusted in uh, an enclosed environment. So there's no CO2 that is brought out, uh, um, released to the, to the atmosphere. And then the uh, wood chips then turn into this thing that they call biochar, which is basically a form of like a activated carbon kind of thing, something like that. Yeah, and um, the heat and energy that is generated from the combustion of the wood chips then powers the inner parts where on the right side you see is actually a microalgae farm. Yeah, so he grows a microalgae because it's uh, one of the substrates that is able to break down and uh, and um add life to the biochar that currently, you know, it's just carbon that has no that has no life. Yeah. And then like his his met, his way of getting inspiration is actually to look into um the processes of the earth, you know, the way that um uh, carbon and coals have been created, the way that soil has been compacted and soil has been made like over millions of years, which goes back to the idea of natural intelligence, you know, understanding like how the earth works, yeah, and then biomimicry, which is to learn from it. Yeah, and to mimic the processes in nature, yeah, in something that actually looks really like tacky and looks really like and disjointed, but um holds a lot of those like um um I would I dare say like wisdom, yeah, in order to create like uh, and speed up the processes that you know the world is, the earth does in millions of years, but he's able to do it in a couple of days, yeah, and to accelerate the recovery of of the planet. Mm. Yeah, and there's also like this, I think, as I mentioned earlier, there's this like better of the two camps, people who be soil farming and soilless farming. So there's the divergence of ideology and inability to see eye to eye in certain ways of the future of food, right? But we're, we're really thinking whether or not like there, there could be a place where two people from, people from the two camps can meet uh, halfway. And if there's a chance for synergy to be formed to, co to build, close loop uh, food system. So I think one example that while Shri and I we were talking about, um, we bounced off this really interesting idea, like Shri mentioned, maybe what we can do with the nutrient, with the water hydroponics farm that has some nutrient solution, can we channel that uh, into a place to feed uh, microalgae that can be uh, 
can be a food source. Yeah. So these are some of the ideas. Like how can we um look using each other's uh like ways in a sense that be one way, or can we can be learning more from nature and adopting it in the food system. Yeah. Mm. So. Yeah. So, you know, like the nutrient water coming out from hydroponics system, right now I think hydroponics is uh, it's almost the opposite of permaculture because in permaculture, we think about um, what are different ways that we can balance the system out. Yeah, but in, uh, and then, you know, you, uh, you accept that there are certain things like what we might call traditionally consider pests yeah, to come into your garden because it's when you, are, when you allow insects to come into your garden, you also get your pollinators. Mm. Uh, you know, applying pesticides on everything and nobody's going to come everything's going to be uh, you know very sterile which right now i think hydroponics um it, they are kind of adopting that method where everything is sterile everything is uh, contained yeah and uh that actually leads to you know neutral water coming in at 100 percent um charity or like you know ideal condition and then after it, it has been used up by the plant it comes out and maybe like a 30 percent like ideal which is not too good for the plants anymore and it just gets disposed off right but what if we could add like a certain bit like something that can um make it a little bit more circular like maybe to grow microalgae in using the using the leftover nutrient water mm -hmm. so that you don't have to spend resources to get rid of it and then you have microalgae that can feed back into your system maybe through something like as a bio um, fertilizer Mm. Yeah, so I think that like um everyone is trying to work to the same goal, like I said, right? Like how do we um integrate knowledge from different camps? Yeah, mm. That, mm. to make that happen. Mm. Mm. So yeah, <laughs> if you need an answer, you wouldn't be called innovation. So yeah, we have a common uh challenge to solve. So I think sometimes it's also to drop our ego to think that there's only one way to problem how about like learning from each other like uh traditional and high tech like whatever it is if it's a good technology to solve a problem uh looking at the whole system of course we can't just look at technology uh for for a certain application but also its implication in the whole system right yeah so basically we are calling you for your help because we need people to plug into our ecosystem and we would love to meet more uh, passionate individuals who have an idea and want to be part of uh, the ideation of how to develop this um, sustainable and circular food system uh, in the every tech space and also the food, food production space. Uh, yeah, sure, you want to flash? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm replying, Benjamin. <laughs> no worries, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that they can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're also looking for mm. you go for it, go for it. Yeah, so we are looking to work with more startups that can help with sustainable ways of living, incorporating food into living solutions, um, and also more sustainable sources of resource inputs, the energy needed to run for uh, hydroponics, and also the nutrients to run for hydroponics to work, and also technologies for growing, uh, be it uh, in, in a space of soilers or soil farming. Yeah, so if you have any questions, please drop them in the box. Uh, otherwise, we really hope to stay connected with all of you. Uh, we have, uh, for Slice Robot Cap, I think we have an email. Uh, yeah, maybe we can drop it in the chat. Mm. Should you anything to add? Uh, I feel that, like, as in this whole thing, like, you know, we're still looking at it from, like, a two camps kind of thing where we're looking into um, every tech and then we're looking into traditional farming. But I, I really do believe that the future of it is a lot more... Um, integrated into even our philosophies mm. of how we engage our lives like you know how there was mm. a place where we understood we cannot pollute the world anymore and then um mm. uh minimum is to not pollute maximum is to try to like recover like re uh, help the world recover and then i think mm. that naturally like I, i'm very heartened to see that um in a very domestic scale people are starting to plan things in their own homes but i'm wondering like at, in at uh like paradigm and community skill, you know, um, could there be like, when, you know, we say startups that can help with sustainable ways of living. Yeah, this is really, really broad because I feel that the best ideas and the best solutions come from teasing in different like um, um, philosophies and we can learn from, you know, whether it's something as random as like uh, making music, you know, 
if let's say we find that there's a correlation with like music and like, with plants and then therefore like you're able to use it in a way that like, you know you might never have thought of it that like you know music and plants and this is an example I, I'm, I'm just uh, making a hypothet hypothetical right situation yeah that um that i think those are the things that can like help us be at the the front of that innovation yeah and i'm super curious because i feel that like the amazing thing about the audacity community is that um we support there's no idea that's too crazy yeah if there's if there's something that we feel that like you know hey this could be possible we're gonna try it yeah because a lot of solutions are already being tried by other people you know other startups so yeah i would love to see like like um hear from you guys like what is your craziest idea um you know what are you guys passionate about you know the kind of ideas that keep you up at night yeah Yeah, I can't hear you. Oh no, what happened? <laughs> Ref can you refresh the page? Amy, anyway, I'd like to invite anybody who is on this to like come on and just like chat with us. Yeah. Uh, so now we're talking about composting. So yeah, like I, yeah, so I think Rebecca is making a, a good point that like it's really about the I think it's about the ecosystem that the composting um area is in. Yeah. Jay, you back? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh yeah, because like I think that in my in my experience, right, there have been certain um neighborhoods that I lived in that I see that even when there's no waste around no composting around, rats still come into the house. Yeah. And there's some places where like, you know, I can leave food out there and like there no roaches, no, no anything. Yeah. So somehow, yeah, I think that like um it really matters as to like what is going on around the, the house and where you're doing the composting. Yeah. Does anyone have any suggestions as to how we can make composting less uh with less with less pests? In Singapore. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, please don't be shy and like, yeah, please drop us any questions. Wait, we can I can hear you again. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. So I think maybe the soil regeneration project guys can advise on that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In general, if there are more browns. Oh yeah, Brian, our trusty urban gardener friend. <laughs> if there are more browns, then the pest pressure is lower. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Cause I think the thing that attracts pests is um uh, moisture and smell. Yeah. Yeah, Brian, I, I think I find myself a sometimes I'm very lazy to cover up. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Brian, what's the ideal for uh, brown brown materials again? Like fifty fifty. Like I know everyone has a different ratio, but I think as long as you have enough carbon materials you can avoid that. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, so food scrap is like, I think it, yeah, it depends. La. Like, it's all about, you know, minimizing the, the moisture that goes into it and then, like, the smells that I emitted from it. Yeah. So, I mean, if I think if you. How do I say this? Um, have to be more selective with what you compost. Yeah. Although, I mean, in, in general, we would love to compost everything that, you know, every waste that comes out of our kitchen. But I think that requires a couple of different um, uh, ways of. Uh, producing uh, or composting yeah whether you use like you know earthworms or like flies or something then there's like a next level thing yeah but naturally with the soil i think there's a certain limit as to how much it can take in a time certain time frame yeah mm. yeah okay guys i think there's nothing else no questions yeah then um you can join us on play show which is an online platform where we can mingle with the with the rest of the community. Thank you so much for joining us. And I uh, hope that you guys like 
has something to think about, yeah, and maybe even learn something. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Rebecca, please drop us a, an email or a message. Yeah. And you can definitely come and visit us. Yeah. Benjamin as well, yeah. All right. Shall we go party? Yeah. Let's find out whether I can find the link to drop to everybody. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, yeah, we will be doing a lot of work on our outdoor farm. Yeah. Mm. So if you like part of the brain of the brawn. Brawn. <laughs> I need mean, brawn. Yeah. yeah, brawn. Yeah. 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 We would love to host you, Benjamin, uh Rebecca. Yeah. Whoever who is here that is new to our community. Yeah. Mm. All right, guys, have a great day. And for the people in America, different time zone, have a great night. Yeah, and we'll see you on Spatial. Bye-bye.